Good evening. It's great to see everyone. Welcome. Um, we are delighted that you could join us for Amina Palmer's um, lecture and gallery opening. I want to mention that we're really grateful for the support of the Missouri Arts Council, as well as the Office of Diversity and Inclusion for their support of this evening's events. And all of you who are attending as a result of um, seeing the publicity of the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, welcome. Um, you are welcome to attend any of our events. Um, I have, before turning over to my colleague, Seishua May, um, introductions, just a few announcements to make, mainly um, announcements and reminders of upcoming exhibitions and events. Um, first, the art program is really pleased to participate in the Office of Diversity and Inclusion Celebration of Women's History Month in the month of March. Um, on Wednesday, March 20th, the university is hosting the Women's Leadership Summit on campus, and that day will culminate with a reception celebrating the official opening of the exhibition Olive Deleuze and Her World in the East Gallery, or sometimes we refer to it as the Back Gallery, um, downstairs in the Deleuze Gallery. And that will occur at the same time that we're also celebrating um, the seniors who are exhibiting work in the senior preview show. So that event is again on Wednesday, March the 20th from four to 6 p.m. And for students in art who um, are required to attend these events, um, that will um, count as makeup credit for those of you who need makeup credit for visiting artists. Um, talk attendance. And then um, our last uh, MAP sponsored artist this year is um, Anna Cowley Ford, who will be with us the week of March the 25th. Um, her lecture and exhibition um, will open on that day. The title of her exhibition is Point of View, Your Insurance Stops Covering Two Medications, that are the biggest part of your treatment plan, and now you're barely a functional person. So Ford's artwork explores her own lived experience of chronic pain. Um, I think the exhibition will be quite different from anything since I've been here um, that we've had in the gallery. So please plan to join us on the 25th for her lecture. The dates of her exhibition are March 25th to April the 12th. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Professor May to introduce our speaker. Uh, so this is uh, Anna Palmer. Uh, she lives and makes work in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, she holds a bachelor's of fine arts in photography and film from Virginia Commonwealth University and a master's of fine arts in design and technology from Parsons School of Design at the New School. Uh, using the everyday as the subject for her photography, she forms her images into found still lives by framing the scenes we pass by daily. She gives a new context to ways uh, the everyday stand out as a unique moments versus just as the mundane. Her presentations typically consist of oversized prints using banners, occasionally incorporating projections, books, or websites. She is the founder and director of the Code Gallery a space which exists through code over the internet and as pop-up exhibitions and workshops. Her curation of the gallery connections in back to how she shapes her images, considering keywords and the uh, concepts as well as form and mediums at play. In both venues, as artist and curator, she aims to encourage others to use their unique lens and visual language to archive and express their own experiences of daily life. Welcome. Hello. Hi, 
I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Amina Palmer, as Fanshawe said. Um, we actually knew each other at our uh, old school. I went there for undergrad, and she went there for a master's. Uh, surprisingly, we didn't really have a full conversation until the last few weeks and then today. <laughs> um, but glad this could come together. Um, and then today I'll be talking about my work broadly, thinking about my photographs as a specific language to me, and then how I encourage other people to think about ways that they encounter their own unique experiences in their daily life. As Fashmi said, I live in Brooklyn right now. Uh, I moved to New York for grad school, otherwise it didn't seem like a reasonable option for me. Um, but I like it a lot because I'm, I'm big on like environments where things are changing daily, um, which I can kind of do anywhere, honestly. Uh, but it helps to be somewhere where it's a little more chaotic than I like at times. Um, I consider my work a hybrid of image collection, curation, and then um, kind of picky and careful presentation of that with the photographs. Um, it all kind of, I kind of got into visual art specifically after a few years of just doing like music through violin, um, but I wasn't something I was able to easily express myself through. I could kind of, um, I could play what I was expected to and like learn from a teacher as best I could. But I noticed that once I had a teacher who no longer could play all of the strings, I was less inspired. Um, so I kind of leaned heavily into just playing around at the time as with an iPod touch to take my photo of just whatever was interesting at the time. And I don't think I really had a specific style until later in high school or uh, going into college. Um, and I happened to find out about art school being a thing at all in my last year. So that's when I hurried over to my art teachers in my school and asked if they'd help me with my portfolio. <laughs> Part of my art practice is um, just documenting daily life, but through a practice that's only really achieved for me by active looking, which I consider to be uh, kind of the continuous process of looking for change, looking for funny moments, uh, and then also repeated uh, like categories of image for me. So it goes into like a word bank you'd find for a puzzle or, um, kind of how word searches work with the bank at the bottom. And that's just kind of internal. <laughs> uh, the language that I'm considering my work through is being a found still life, which is how I learn to kind of associate the photos I'm taking in a more fine art space um, using the format of a still life. And then in my work, because it's uh, images and subjects I'm finding out in the world or in a building uh, because they're found uh, calling to uh, other found artwork. Uh, that's where that terminology comes from for me and helps me link my work to like a broader art historical scope. And then from that uh, practice of just collecting and archiving the world as I'm seeing it, I uh, started to think of translation as well, just because I have an interest in learning languages and then seeing how different rule sets kind of um, coalesce and uh, how languages interact with one another. Uh, so from that, I started thinking of translation and uh, translating still lives, which led to um, different formats <laughs> that were possible in my images. So I have like images to keywords, which is kind of uh, my attempt at first of figuring out how to tell someone about the photos I'm taking besides saying that, oh, this is a brick wall or this is um, a beat up street sign or something like that. It's, to me, it feels really obvious. <laughs> so from that, I got the keywords, which were just like uh, pulling out a word or two of what I'm seeing in the moment uh, or after I'm taking the photograph. And then from there, I also played around with image to 3D, which I'll show you examples of later, uh, which is just a fun way to pull back like a digital photograph into a physical space as a 3D print. 
Uh, from there, I also played around with sound and screens, so like projection and then uh, making sound from images using the data. Uh, and also poetry has been a fun way to play with uh, words for me and then um, projecting on the images as a surface, kind of playing with prints. Um, these are kind of examples of other ways I've presented my work over the years. Uh, mostly in my undergrad time at VCU or right afterwards. Um, the top top two representations I was kind of thinking about the image and keywords still, um, just following an interest with um, plastic bags <laughs> being something I notice in daily life but aren't thought of as artwork um, per se, even though someone did design them. <laughs> um, and then kind of the bottom Row, it was my first solo show, um, which kind of came together um, with two professors I had previously actually who run a gallery back home uh, in Richmond. Yeah, these are some other like areas of interest that I come up with when I'm thinking about my work and how to describe it. Uh, it's more so like, the ways I've been working with image. Uh, so collecting the translation, uh, what's in between um, those different sort of language sets of flat formed um, poetry surface, things like that. And then also like playing with words and thinking of image albums, how we have on our, our devices versus like printed photo albums. And then also thinking of image as sound is something I'll probably come back to in like the next year or so. I'm thinking about um, music albums. So an early practice I kind of talked about a little bit already was just in, I think, my sophomore year <laughs> at VCU. Um, trying to figure out how to best describe the photos I was taking and why they're important to me. Uh, I still don't really like that process, <laughs> actually, so it kind of um, becomes an iterative task in that way of um, kind of figuring out what I'm seeing in that moment, why I was drawn to it, um, also location, which you'll see in the book I prepared for the show here, um, and thinking of home and mapping in that way. Uh, <laughs> this work also went with the keywords practice. So I'd made a website that um, kind of gave the illusion of a double-sided image where you click the image and it turns into uh, the keywords kind of exemplified as the larger banner in the center that was um, the opposite of the words, <laughs> wires, uh, windows, wires, spirals, bricks, and corners. Um, I also played around with uh, little features that I noticed in our classroom and then put like the print of the photo on top. <laughs> and this is just that project the website portion anyway clicking through with like HTML and CSS, which are like just basic coding things that I remembered from editing blogs on Tumblr. <laughs> kind of came back to that process and then mixing it in as an artistic medium. So making like this kind of work in a photo program is to me kind of uh, unconventional and differed a lot from what my classmates were making at the time, mostly portraits and uh, playing around more so with our studio lighting uh, equipment that we had uh, on offer. Um, so going from that and trying to continue the process of seeing what, in, what, in what ways I could actually like break <laughs> uh, the processes uh, I was used to 
um, and also keep it interesting for my classmates of <laughs> versus the wires and walls and stuff like that. Um, I went into this project, which ended up being my thesis work um, following uh, image to 3D. So I was able to break a, a 3D modeling program a few times and then pull images back into Photoshop because they have a 3D platform. And I just played around with that to make um, images uh, 3D in that way, kind of reforming something that I flattened in a digital camera. Uh, and then printing it again as 3D prints. Um, I was also interested with the in-between stage, so thinking of uh, what's called a transliteration, so that's uh, the pronunciation usually of a translated word. Uh, so the, the banners were supposed to be the in-between stage. Uh, it's also what it looks like in the Photoshop file as I was working with the image to print them and like knocking off a bunch of information so I didn't break the printers <laughs> as well. Um, and then the 3D prints are beside them. Uh, the banners ended up being about 24 by 36 as flat banners. And then the 3D prints were about four by six, like handheld, um, kind of how you would expect a photo print from Walgreens or CVS. Uh, and that work went on to be the well, it was made also to be part of the beginnings of my gallery space called Decode, uh, which also came to be from that interest in coding um, and kind of a, at that time it was more of a fictional space, playing around with the language used when talking about gallery spaces and how it's just kind of circular and harder to understand as someone who's not already working in the space and then uh, also, as a senior in college, <laughs> not really knowing how to approach this, those spaces in that way. Um, and from there, I like I coded the website for the gallery uh, in a web design class <laughs> in the choice department, and actually, um, uh, where we uh, coded, I coded the website for that, also had the sort of art gallery ephemera, so like the show card and price list as part of the work. Uh, was prepared to sell a few pieces at my show if it happened, but uh, with, with COVID hitting like the week before our work was supposed to go up, didn't happen in that order. <laughs> and I had made been making posters for like a year or so before, uh, still playing around in Photoshop because Illustrator is annoying <laughs> to me. Uh, but yeah, just playing around in image software, making things that you're not really expected to, per se. Um, and the posters went on to be useful in making work for my gallery as well um, as filler and then also as promotion for that show. So let's click over to the gallery space, uh, but that little um, building is when I was breaking Maya trying to fit my images in <laughs> the 3D model I was making uh, and gave up on that, quickly went to the website instead. <laughs> Uh, afterwards, I uh, took about a year off of school after I graduated, uh, just, you know, living life, <laughs> and then um, headed out to Parsons in New York. Uh, still wasn't really sure what my next translation might be, so I decided to think back onto uh, what a video and sound professor had had us play around with a little bit, which was uh, tossing in uh, image data into Audition, which is like Adobe's uh, sound mm -hmm. platform. Uh, and from that, I made a projection as well and uh, cut into a piece of foam as like a 3D image as well, but larger than I had last time. Uh, and kind of all of these, this, these projects are just a way for me to uh, like play around with ideas <laughs> while I still have the resources to um, make things at the scale I wanted to as well for a little less than outsourcing. <laughs> and I think each translation kind of lent itself to forming a new like pathway in my brain of like what's possible, um, who I can work with to make these things, like which friends I need to reach out to to figure out a machine or um, <laughs> 
what to do in between on breaks of thinking about all this stuff. And then because I'm running the gallery as well, I'm always looking at other artwork um, just to be one inspired, but also to share it. I try to keep up with postings on the Instagram for that. Uh, fall behind it occasionally, but once a month seems like enough for me <laughs> right now, um, where um, each project I'm working on myself, I've probably seen um, a snippet, a clip, or some sort of image archived either on interest on Instagram or Pinterest um, as like a large, overly sized, overstuffed mood board of sorts. Um, and then I can come back to it later and figure out what I want to make. While I try not to look directly at anything at the time, it does help to have like a cloud of ideas. So with the, the piece I made with the sound, you'll see in a minute. Um, I was looking at projection again, um, carving, and then collecting a lot of images of greats myself in like that two or three months, I think. <laughs> so I decided to make a great album and um, use, using greats uh, <laughs> and titled the project album release. Um, so it has like the sound that came from the audition file of the images all together. And then it's projected on. I don't really like the sound, but it's there. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's what that sounds like. There's a bunch of images of greats kind of pressed together. You can imagine it's like running across the, the print I made as well. Um, after that, I need I needed to go back to some some silence, <laughs> but I'm always listening to music while I'm working anyway. Um, so I started thinking about lyrics, lyricism, language again more directly, and tried out some poetry. Um, even though at first it was more like pulling teeth, but I happened to be in a great class for that, where um, the image makers in the class were encouraged to write poetry and the poets were encouraged to make images. Um, so it helped a lot to be able to make in a space where we weren't necessarily being critiqued on our, our work as I'd been used to. Um, so we could just kind of respond to the prompts as we felt like. <laughs> but otherwise, someone I look to a lot um, in terms of framing the everyday and then explaining your work or inviting others in is um, Enoch, who goes by Ordinary Anywhere on Instagram now. Um, he does a great job in going through uh, what he's seeing and what like stood out in the images as well as uh, kind of just inviting someone to maybe recompose uh, the photos at times and see what they maybe would crop in or crop out. Uh, also does kind of a daily walking practice in his area, uh, which to me is inspiring because we can do this anywhere. <laughs> um, from that, I also was looking at more poetry directly. I really liked this page on the left, Poetry is Not a Luxury, because it kind of frames image as text by using Instagram as their platform. Uh, so then in my own work, uh, as well as inspired by Christian Michael Filardo, uh, who does like great books. <laughs> um, I went on to uh, also find Lee Ray Walsh, who I also kind of knew from Richmond vaguely because they visited like once, I think. Um, gave a great talk to me in my freshman year, actually. Uh, but they do great image IDs for their photos and kind of lets you into what was going on in that moment more so for them. Uh, something I aspire <laughs> to do more of rather than just 
like a one word uh, caption. And from that, I was making uh, poems that were kind of functioning as an equal to the image instead of uh, a caption. So clicking through this website I made um, should kind of, <laughs> oh, it does invite the visitor on like the about page to kind of follow the same process of first taking images, then pulling out your keywords yourself uh, and writing kind of as a, an additional practice to understanding the photos you're taking. And I did choose to also keep the keywords on the page as visible. Uh, here's some examples. And I'm really into cones, so there's going to be one on probably, probably everything. <laughs> uh, I kind of see them as stand-ins for people in a lot of the photos I'm taking, because uh, I do make a point to wait till people pass by <laughs> to take the images I want. Or like let my friends leave me uh, to keep walking. <laughs> um, my thesis project at Parsons turned out to be a way to revive my gallery space as well. Um, and in that, I used the project, like the sort of evidentiary work as um, a way to use surface again, so projection. And then I also really wanted to uh, print and then project on that. Uh, so for that installation, I played around with um, kind of just the, the photos I'm taking all the time. <laughs> and then choosing which ones I wanted to be kind of um, in between objects. So you have the projection at work through the whole archive. Um, kind of, this was my idea coming up with it. I wanted to have two um, mesh prints kind of in the front. Uh, so the light would go through because the vinyl is perforated, it has a bunch of holes in it. Uh, and it did work, thankfully. <laughs> After I told my class about it the whole semester, it did work. Um, so from that um, kind of project, the artwork itself, um, I used it as a way to kind of revive decode as a um, living entity in the pop-up and then also to host um, workshops revolving around that poems process in this project, um, continuing that and um, kind of reviving the space in that way. This is what the installation ended up looking like in part. Um, and I guess I've also never really had like the expected <laughs> thesis showings either, just because of what's going on in the world. And then my, my last program at Parsons, we like shared the floor with um, our, our class floor actually with um, EFA as well. So with bachelor's and master's all in one space showcasing the work we made for thesis. And it was a great opportunity to see like what everyone had been working on. Um, Cause I kind of just went to school and went home <laughs> a lot of the time. Um, and then to see also uh, who was placed in the same room as you was also a fun moment because uh, my classmate and I had work that needed less light <laughs> than everyone else. So we, did, we were able to do that and like close the blinds in our space. Uh, so that worked out pretty well. This is what mine ended up looking like. I also played with the scaffolding outside of the window by leaving mine kind of open. Yeah, and I think it was the day of, we didn't really know for sure if everything would go up the way I sketched it out because the struts were not able to be put in the ceiling. <laughs> so I was able to get a uh, lot of the faculty just to get up on the ladder and drill some holes <laughs> that way. Hopes of the banners are better. And for that project, I also made like a spring catalog for the gallery. So that was about the research I was doing, um, kind of at what was expected for thesis work in, in any way for the writing aspect. Um, and then I also included a bunch of 
names to know, um, use my typography class <laughs> to learn about the grid for that book, the second version of it. Um, and just had a good time really putting everything I was learning into one thing. Thanks. <laughs> Questions? There have to be some questions. Yes. Like, is was those your portfolio for your school, or is that like your career that you're like doing right now? Uh, I'm doing this right now forever, but all of that was in school for the most part. I'm only 26. <laughs> That's most of that was in school. Uh, and then trying to keep busy afterwards has been fun, but because my practice is daily for the most part, it just happens. <laughs> this was the, the show for this was the most like real making I've done in a little while, but I do a lot of the photos every day. And then I've also really gotten into making reels <laughs> on Instagram, like little videos I would take instead of photos or in addition to Why do you like cones and signs the most? What draws you to them? Uh, for the cones, I kind of see them as stand-ins for people. And so in a way, I would take portraits. Uh, I, I took some photos of actual people for like assignments and stuff, but it didn't really, it wasn't as fun. It kind of seemed performative in that way to me, where I was really just doing it to try out the equipment or get the grade. <laughs> but with the cones, I think, um, Especially going from Richmond to New York, that's been a, kind of a marker of place as well, where they both have a lot of those. There's construction all the time. And uh, the cones are also like left behind. So <laughs> never off work <laughs> in that way. Oh I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, so you home and it's very very urban nature. Mm -hmm. So for you, home is, is an urban environment. Um, cities seem to play a really big role in uh, the way that you conceptualize home. And so I was really taken by the projection of images um, of a city environment on the the landscape, which looks like the Grand Canyons right. or you know majestic beauty, and what is it that you're saying through layering um, images of urbanism um, onto um, natural beauty? Right for for this exhibition, I did choose to have that photo as the largest one, um, not just because it was photograph nature, like not a photo I've taken per se, but as a print in the window actually. So I'm actually, I'm in the photo as well, because it's reflected back. Um, so in a way it's like free travel <laughs> in that moment, uh, but I'm also really drawn to other prints and images of nature. Um, and I don't think I'm drawn to it as itself a lot of the time uh, because home is very much City to me, I think. Um, and I have allergies. I'm not trying to be outside too much um, a whole season of the year. Um, but uh, yeah, replicating nature in the fun way that you can uh, further puts the images of still life too. Thank you. Of course. Uh, I have a related question. Um, because as, as visual artists, we we are dealing with space. Um, and uh, could could you talk a little more about how um, how, how you view space? Uh, or could, could you talk about how um, how you go back and forth or, or, or any kind of relationship that that you are dealing with in your work between physical space? Mm -hmm. And virtual space and the intersection of those, uh, because everything, every image you've shown us is seems to be somehow about that. Uh, well, I guess I'll start with 
as far out as I usually go with, the, with like the internet being a space uh, and existing in that as code, but then also having some of my work communicate like the photos be digital, they're existing in that realm already, um, making it easy to upload and archive, uh, thinking of space also, the images can be like the road signs we have or um, kind of points on the map as well. And then when it comes to space in installations, he kept pulling back to layering as well, bringing that off of a flat screen or surface is fun to me. Um, kind of pulling things to scale uh, that makes the most sense for me in that moment as well, uh, which doesn't always have to be like one-to-one -one life size, but bigger or smaller as well. Uh, I really enjoy uh, the like four by six uh, like Walgreens prints size photos as well. Um, just to have the experience of looking through a pile of images uh, and maybe art, um, art maybe uh, categorizing them in that way. <laughs> and then otherwise space, I think because a lot of the photos I'm taking, if you were to make them black and white, I'd lose a lot of my context. <laughs> So um, using the images, I can kind of pinpoint where I was in that moment, whether it was uh, a certain street back in Richmond or an area in New York now. Um, it helps a lot with my visual memory. So <laughs> just remembering where I was, uh, maybe what else I took that day or uh, how the spaces change over time, uh, even day to day. I have a few pictures, for example, that uh, show like a, a fake brick wall where I saw one day the, the space was just a flat concrete and then they were putting up the fake brick and then the next day it was painted. <laughs> so this marking change in that way helps me make sense of myself in space. Is, is the internet um, a physical space for you? Do you think of the internet as, as a space like this room as a space? Not usually, actually. I think maybe social media more so, but then the internet for me feels kind of flat and kind of uh, like you can rifle some of the thoughts on it in that way. But the, but the social media side is uh, it's in, more connected. It's three dimensional. Yeah. Interesting. Could you talk more about that? <laughs> well, I think it helped me a lot with um, not so much keeping up with what people are saying, but like also what they're doing. Uh, so like Instagram, for example, um, kind of feels like a gallery. Like I try to curate my space uh, in, that, in that realm as well. <laughs> um, so like the images that are passing in front of us uh, on the feed happens to be vertical. So I think a lot of times I'm picturing it side by side. Uh, and rarely am I going to someone's full profile anymore. <laughs> so it's just like what's visible in front of me at the moment. Kind of like how if you're walking on the street, uh, you can see like the people with the new Apple Vision thing <laughs> kind of just right in front of you. Um, and I think the way that I perceive uh, the images online kind of interrupts your thoughts. And that's also how I'm seeing the moments that I'm capturing as kind of immediate in that way. Mm -hmm. This is just an observation. Did you go to the, like, during quarantine, I think they had a uh, Van Gogh exhibition and how they portrayed it is similar. How you portrayed your work, making it 3D. It made the whole room, like the projector lit up the whole room and showed like his house painting, it made the whole room look like the house and just made all of his, I, I didn't go, my brother and his girlfriend went. And your work feels similar to how they portrayed his work. Did you, like, have you seen something like that? I think I mostly saw like, the promotion for it. The closest experience I've had of something like painted come to life was like a Edward Popper exhibition at the Museum of Virginia, the Museum of Fine Arts. They had like a almost a life-size diorama, like a window as big as this screen. 
um, kind of going into one of his paintings where they had uh, like the hotel room scene that is actually a painting of his wife. So kind of playing with light in that way. But the Van Gogh I've heard is a lot more moving image. So that would be cool. <laughs> Did you, from the exhibition you were talking about, did you draw inspiration for that? Is like, what makes you take the flat image of the pictures you make and make it 3D into your space? Like, what makes your brain make that connection? I think it's because uh, in this way, I'm also still working with prints. So they're still flat. And to me, that makes it easier to, um, easier to handle in a, in a space. Like I have a harder time with uh, like three making like clay and sculpture and some uh, glass and things like that. I'd like to try them at some point, but I don't think I have that like dexterity. So working with flat objects kind of feels like I, I can pull like a SketchUp model up in my head to arrange things. Um, and then playing with them in this way, uh, it felt like I was using lenses and screens still. Uh, thank you for your presentation and for being here. Um, a basic question, what kind or kinds of cameras do you use in your photography? Great. Uh, day to day, I'm using my phone a lot because I don't enjoy having my camera um, tethered to me in that and like a way where a camera strap does or even the weight. Uh, but with my phone, I feel like I can uh, take it out, use it quickly enough, not be in anyone's way per se, and then just tuck it in my pocket. Uh, and I, I think that also came to me because I started taking photos actually with like a small camcorder. I think it was like 10 or something that broke. Um, I ended up getting like an iPod touch in middle school and go taking photos with that, um, just on walks with my mom or from the school bus. Uh, and then phones from really then on, because my uh, smaller camera I had at the time wasn't as crisp. <laughs> so like the, the crispness was something I really prioritized. So yeah, as long as, as, long as the camera's not cracked, I feel like I could use it. And I also didn't and really enjoy like darkroom photography. It wasn't, I didn't have an automatic camera and I kind of need that a bit more with the vision <laughs> that I have. Uh, so digital also sticking with that. Um, I guess my question would be like relating to, well, I guess, Anytime I go out and take pictures, I think I'm kind of drawn to the similar things that you are. Like, I like street life and, like, kind of just little things catch my eye. And even if I don't end up using them, like, I'll just have that picture and, like, look back on it. But um, also since, like, going to the city for me growing up was, like, kind of exciting for us. I live in Savannah, which is, like, less than an hour away. But, um you get some sort of like emotion out of it or some sort of, sort of like feeling of like sentiment or like excitement, I guess. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm definitely excited about the photos I take. Um, I also keep all of them in like a Flickr account as storage. And then I keep the ones I uh, like took a bit more intentionally or want to keep to use in some way on my phone um, still. But yeah, definitely excited about the photos I'm taking and then uh, also the repeats. So like the photos I retake a week later, a month later, however however that happens. Um, and then I think the moments where I actually am like, disappointed <laughs> in a photo is like if the focus wasn't there and I only took one or something like that and then I, it probably won't happen again <laughs> the same way. It'll be a little different. Uh, but yeah, I got to hold on to all of them but not necessarily printing everything. Yes. Um, I just wanted to ask about like, what does your day-to-day -day look like? Are you like dedicating time to just go out and take pictures or are you like, do you go out and like, like what do you do? Like what, what does a normal day look like for you? Like do you dedicate time to work? 
Mm. Well, right now I'm working in an exhibition space. It's a pop up. So I'm explaining all day, every day of like who the collectors of that work are, like what's in the show. Um, otherwise, even in school, my photo practice was mostly like on my commute, like on the way to and from school. Um, other times I would schedule out like an hour or two, go go for a walk specifically to look for pictures. Um, otherwise, it's, it's stuff I'm noticing really just in the day. A lot more in like spring, summer. I have a harder time with it in winter because of the lighting, I think. Um, and I uh, have playing with flash for a little bit. I I noticed that that helped uh, make more things look nice <laughs> in winter to me. Um, yeah, playing with lighting, different times of day. Uh, I feel like if I scheduled like every day at noon to go do this, it wouldn't be as fun. <laughs> So just to be clear, your 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 day job is at an exhibition space. Yeah, at the moment, like a gallery. Mm -hmm. it, it, is this in Brooklyn? Or? It's in Manhattan, yeah. uh, Chelsea Bay Area. Is internet culture and liberal spaces and like archiving stuff very important to you? Like archiving like your moments in life and like nostalgia. Is that like a big part of the work, would you say? I think so, because I'd be really upset if something happened to my Instagram in particular. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, I keep, I keep, I have photos from like 2017 still on my phone, even though I've gotten maybe one or two more since, since that time. Um, so I have photos on my phone on Flickr, but like digital archive is big for me. Um, also on like a portable hard drive holding on to the to the images that I'd like to keep which is great and then uh for like regular life where I'm not necessarily seeing things as art I do try to still document it might not be like as artistically done or framed exactly as like ideal in the moment um, but I definitely hold on to them and look back uh, like making like highlights and um, like reels I said I've been making them of like my museum visits just because I noticed like family and friends really like flipping through my stories on those days and kind of following along, even if like they're at work when I'm at the museum or something like that. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>